how does one explain the great diversity in anatomical structures and you know talk about their origin their function their diversity uh, etc um, well one could do this in a number of contexts um, I teach a course in comparative vertebrate anatomy and obviously throughout the course and you know, we talk about how skeletal systems have arrived at their uh, modern diversity how respiratory systems how uh, urinary systems muscular systems uh, etc um, this video is going to take a slightly different uh, tack um, in that, uh, although evolution is one of the most fundamental ideas in biology and one of the best proven theories in all of science, um, one, it is the job of science students to doubt and to question. Um, and so when I say there is an overwhelming uh, amount of evidence for evolution and there is saying anything else would simply be you know misinformation um, nevertheless that doesn't mean that it's right all right because in science it's our job to doubt and to question you never accept something as true because your teacher said so or because the textbook says so at every point you should if you're thinking scientifically say what is the evidence for that is there another explanation so if you are doing that that's fine you know, and as for a scientific thinker, you are doing your job. Um, and so therefore, doubting any idea in, in biology or any science, every idea in science, that's appropriate, even, you know, when it comes to, say, a theory. So if you're saying, is there, you know, enough evidence, you know, is there another explanation? Well, that, uh, once again, that uh, is fine. And at a certain level, that is our job. Um, now, uh, you could go a bit beyond that. So you could say, you know, I have an alternate idea. I believe that instead of uh, the anatomy uh, of the diverse organisms alive today evolving over time from common ancestors, I believe that this is the result of creation. I believe that this is intelligently designed. That's fine. You know, in science, that's what one does. One proposes alternate hypotheses. However, the next step then is, then you go out and test them and ask, does, my, does the evidence support my model? And so these models, the evolution model, the creation model, the uh, intelligent design model, um, they do vary. And obviously I have, you know, cartoon versions here to you know, kind of make it uh, a bit more humorous. Um, so for example, um, the uh, evolution model holds that, uh, whether it be my anatomy or that of a bird or that of a, a tree, you know, a white oak tree, et cetera, um, that these you know, individuals, these species have not always existed and that their anatomy has been inherited from common ancestors and has changed over time. All right, now, since the earlier common ancestors would then be simpler, this then implies that complexity can evolve over time, that there is then shared anatomical features. And given that, and I discussed this in other uh, videos, that this family tree of common ancestry um, has produced groups such as, you know, the vertebrates, the mammals, the apes, the eukaryotes, etc. that then we would see the distribution of these anatomical um, uh, traits following this pattern as I'll be describing. So the common ancestor of, say, the vertebrates would then pass down, you know, anatomical structures to surviving vertebrates. So if you ask, why do some animals have this trait? It's because the you know, ancestral uh, vertebrates, the ancestral amniotes had this trait. In the creation model, all modern kinds, whatever that is, we'll get back to that, um, they appeared suddenly from nowhere and are completely unrelated. So humans are 100% unrelated to apes and to squirrels and to alligators and to frogs, etc. So that's easy to test. It's easy to test that this organism is 100% unrelated to uh, other organisms. There are no similarities which are uh, expected. If you do find similarities, um, well, 
you know, once again, uh, if you're going to argue that the supernatural is involved, obviously a supernatural creator could do whatever a supernatural creator chose to do. Um, um, but then in a scientific sense, how do you test that? So if you then test that, if there are similarities, they are for a reason so that maybe all flying animals were given this trait to fly or all of this were, were uh, swimming animals were given this trait uh, to uh, swim then your uh, hypothesis is that the explanation for anatomical similarities is say design for a specific lifestyle or design for a specific type of diet fine we could test that so when we look at the similarities of life on earth do we see that the only explanation that fits the data is a common design for a lifestyle, all right? All right. Um, if one were to, uh, the main argument in intelligent design is that complexity cannot evolve in stages. The main argument of intelligent design is that of, quote, irreducible complexity, that you can't get a complex eye over stages, you can't get a complex skull over changes, that the complexity of the human brain, the complexity of the arthropod head, etc., could not evolve in stages, because what good would half an eye be? or half a brain, or half a heart, or whatever. Any animal that has half a structure would be bad at what it did, it would die. And so therefore you could never have um, an organism evolving in stages. So in the intelligent design model, the main argument is that um, even though a little, little evolution might occur, we would see what's called irreducible complexity. So that complex eyes would have to appear kind of like from nowhere, um, with no intermediate stages because anything that has an intermediate stage wouldn't be able to see and they would die. So brains would not have intermediate stages where they gradually got more complex. Um, respiratory systems, lungs would not have intermediate stages where they gradually get um, a more uh, complex uh, that uh, would then be uh, impossible. So this is great. We have different ideas and they make different hypotheses. You know, and some people forget. They say, oh, uh, you know, I, I hold to this model. So let me, you know, there's something that I'm not satisfied with the evolutionary explanation. Remember these three models, they all make predictions. The creation model holds that all life is 100% unrelated if it's not in the same kind. And so then what predictions would you make if you're comparing the anatomy of things which are 100% unrelated? Do you expect to see similarities, a pattern of similarities? If you hold that complexity is irreducible, you can't have anything that's intermediate, um, then what uh, do you uh, expect when you start looking at uh, uh, organisms. Do you expect to have organisms that have some but not all of the complexity found in more um, advanced uh, groups? So uh, we have different models. They make different predictions and this is great because now we can go out and test these. Now let me be honest, the great difficulty that I have here is that I teach a course in comparative vertebrate anatomy. And I love to talk about the gradual evolution of anatomical systems over the course of a semester. But the video that I'm making here is meant not to be for, say, an upper level biology student in a comparative vertebrate anatomy course, but kind of a synopsis. And so what I'm struggling with is then how to, you know, cram, you know, that much detail or what's the best way uh, to organize it. So let me kind of do it two ways. I'd like to maybe do like this just very quick overview and then maybe then just go back and then revisit it system by system and point out a few things on the skeletal system, the respiratory system, etc. So um, number one, so this is the really quick uh, synopsis. The first uh, thing I'd like to say is um, when you start looking at uh, other organisms, one of the things that you are struck with is similarities, all right? So I have uh, parietal bones. I look at this bowfin, it has parietal bones. I have a zygomatic bone, which is, we also call it jugal, before it uh, forms this postorbital bar. And this fish forms one, etc. There are similarities. Now, if I am 100% unrelated to fish, 
There are lots of ways that you can make a fish skull. You don't have to use bone. I'm sure there could be other hard substances. And if you're going to have bone, you certainly don't have to organize it using the same pieces that I um, have, but the same bones are there. If you were to compare my arm to that of a cat, I use my arm to, you know, to play guitar, to hold things and, and such. Um, cats are using their arm to walk on. All right, they're using it as a leg. Um, and so there doesn't have to be anything in simil uh, any similarities between my, you know, manipulating tools, playing the guitar arms, and a cat's walking on arms. But there are, not only are there the same bones, not only do we both have a humerus, um, you can see, um, and that the humerus has the same structure, uh, greater and lesser tubercles, a trochlea, a capitulum. When you compare my leg for upright walking to a cat's leg for quadrupedal locomotion, um, you see the same structures, greater and lesser trochanters, the condyles, you know, uh, et cetera. So the similarities are there. The same is true when we look at muscles, right? When you look at this goat, um, goats are walking on their arms, not playing the guitar, you know, and playing sports, etc. Um, but what muscles are in the arm of the goat? Well, you see the biceps brachii, the brachialis, the triceps brachii, the deltoid, deltoid, the same muscles that I have, the same nerves that a pig sends to its hooves to walk on are the same nerves that uh, are sending commands to my fingers on how to do dexterous movements and, you know, um, uh, play the guitar or kayak or, or, or do whatever. Um, when we look at uh, brains, uh, you know, the regions of the human brain include a medulla, a cerebellum, a midbrain, a cerebrum, and we see that in the brains of a frog, in the brains of a turtle. When you look at a um, mammal, we see the same regions of the brain. A chimpanzee's brain has all of the same regions that yours does. Some of yours are bigger, three times bigger, like in the case of the cerebrum and the cerebellum. But just whether it's the parts of the heart or the parts of the uh, digestive tract or the parts of the urinary or reproductive uh, tracts, the organs are there, the parts of the organs uh, are there. Um, not, um, the, so point number one is there are similarities. Um, the second point I'd like to make is there is a pattern of similarities, a pattern that only the evolutionary model predicts. So in evolution, uh, the model is that life forms this family tree, which shares common descent. We are related to all other organisms, but to varying degrees. Humans share our last common ancestor with apes much more recently than we share uh, our common ancestor with primates. And let's number them if we want. Um, let's say, um, you know, the common ancestor of humans and apes is number 24. The common ancestor of humans and primates is 20. So at different points in this family tree, and we could number them, this is when this lineage broke off from uh, other lineages. Once again, if you're a science student, you should say, that's an interesting hypothesis. What's the evidence for that? Prove that. I'm not going to believe you. I'm not going to take your word for it. Good. And if you're doing that to me, good for you. You're thinking scientifically. You're saying, what evidence would support that? Well, you know, whether we look at pictures, all right, so for example, um, if you were to look at the uterus of most mammals, it is Y-shaped, um, but in primates, it's pear-shaped. And then you would realize, oh, not only are there similarities, like the possession of a uterus um, uh, and live birth, which would occur for the live-bearing uh, mammals, say, around spot uh, 18, um, uh, but now uh, when the shape actually resembles that of uh, humans, that would be a primate feature uh, here at spot uh, 20. Um, hearts exist long before there is a complete separation between the right half of the heart um, and the left half of the heart. So for example, frogs have a right and left atrium, but only a single ventricle. It would be in our lineage, the mammals, which completely divide the ventricles with an interventricular um, uh, septum, so that there is a pattern, so that there aren't just similarities. Mammals share 
features that reptiles don't have, all right? Now, in the creation model, like a, a squirrel and an alligator are equally unrelated to humans. I would be 100% unrelated to a squirrel. I would be 100% unrelated to an alligator or say this sheep. All right, I'm 100% unrelated to the sheep. But not only do I see similarities um, between me and this sheep, there's a pattern, all right? This sheep and I, because we're placental mammals, we share more together than I do with the uh, alligator because, um, I believe this is a goat, uh, between this goat and uh, myself, because we are placental mammals, we share more... Um, anatomical features. So not only are there similarities, there is a pattern of similarities, the pattern that the evolutionary model predicts and the pattern which is exactly the opposite of uh, the creation model, which holds that all of these are 100% unrelated. There is no pattern. But whether you look at the urinary system, the uh, muscular system, the nervous system, we get this pattern. Once again, I'll go into this in a little greater detail in a second. Finally, intelligent design holds that you can't get complex features in steps. All right, you can't have complexly slowly building in intelligent design. The main argument is that complexity is, quote, irreducible. You can't have something that has some, but not all, of the features of a more complex individual like myself. But cartilage exists. Um, before there was bone in, you know, fossil fish, in some modern fish, um, and then even in some uh, invertebrates, there is cartilage or cartilage-like tissues. Um, skulls uh, existed before they had all of the pieces of um, my uh, skull. Even once the pieces of my skull were there, it still had to develop its complexity so that you know the frontal bone didn't have sinuses or didn't have the shape like a slope to enclose a large a large brain that lots of the bones that I had, like the temporal, the occipital, etc., were built by taking smaller bones and smushing them together. So fish have a lot more bones in their skulls. Mammals took these and fused them, so lots of little bones fused to form the occipital or the temporal. The premaxillary bone that I had as a fetus fused to the maxillary, um, etc. So lots of things did. Uh, evolve slowly. So whether we look at fossils or at modern organisms, we can see that vertebrae um, evolved in stages because vertebrae can exist as they do in, say, modern lampreys, as little pieces of cartilage over the notochord or a um, uh, little piece of cartilage over and beneath the notochord or surrounding the, the notochord. Um, this animal doesn't have a circulatory system, a respiratory system, or a urinary system. And if you ask, how could an animal lack these systems? The answer is it's flat. If you're flat, then you can um, get away without a circulatory uh, a system because so much of uh, the materials that you need can diffuse into the water around you. And here the intestine is very highly branched. So the intestine is kind of serving uh, the role of a circulatory uh, uh, system. So um, here you have an animal with some complex features, but not as much uh, as uh, the animals um, uh, which are more uh, advanced. So complexity can develop in steps. You can even have animals that don't even have a circulatory system, a respiratory uh, system, uh, etc. Um, hearts could develop in stages. So there are hearts with one atrium, one ventricle, or two atria and one ventricle, or now two atria and ventricle. Uh, and two ventricles. You can have swim bladders, which do allow gas exchange with the air. There are lungs that, oh, here's that uh, swim bladder. Um, and you can have lungs that exist in fish. So as we look around us, the, all of the complex uh, structures, which say we have in humans, we can find examples of animals which have some, but not all of those complex features. Complexity can develop in stages. Now, once again, I'd like to you know, revisit uh, all of uh, this uh, with uh, videos. Um, but um, 
this once again, because this could be uh, discussed for an entire semester, I'm obviously trying to, to cram a lot of information in, in a short period of time. Let me just kind of revisit that with two systems that look at something, uh, th this pattern a little bit differently. So once again, if you said prove it, prove that complexity develops in stages. All right, well, let's take each of these and then each of these steps, then list, say, part of the skeletal system. What does their skeletal system consist of? All right, and if you look long before there are complex skeletal systems like uh, mine, um, we can find new features that did not exist um, before. And so the new features at each step are given uh, in yellow. So um, the jawless fish, they have new features which aren't known in chordates. The jawed vertebrates have new features here in yellow that didn't exist in the uh, jawless uh, fish. Now notice there's a lot of uh, unshaded features. These are the ones which are kept from the previous stage. So when you ask what would describe the um, last common uh, ancestor between cartilaginous fish and bony fish and those representatives alive today. There would be some things they inherited from their ancestors and some new features. And then when we get to the bony fish ancestor, there would be uh, features which are unshaded, which they inherit from their ancestors, and then new features, etc. And then as we go along, there gets to be less and less yellow. When I look at my skeleton, here I can see it being built in stages. All right, at each stage, a few new features are added. So when we get to the first reptiles, there are new features here in yellow, but most of the aspects of the skeleton are just being inherited from previous um, uh, ancestors. So the skeletal system, it does um, appear in stages with animals which have some, but not all of the features of uh, the uh, the later groups. Now, in uh, the the remaining ones, I do it a little bit differently, um, where I don't have that long list of the traits which are kept over from the previous stage. I just have the new ones. So, if you were to ask, could a nervous system be built in steps? Well, yes. All right. The first uh, metazoan animals with tissues have these new traits that their ancestors didn't have. Um, the first uh, deuterostomes have these new traits. Uh, the first chordates have these new traits. Uh, the first uh, vertebrates have these new traits. The first jawed vertebrates have these new traits, etc. So at each step, you should ask, prove it. What new traits of the nervous system um, appeared in the ancestors of this part of the family tree at spot 18? And then go study anatomy and come up with that list. Now, not only is all of this evidence for the evolutionary model that um, there is a pattern of similarities in that uh, ever, uh, the groups above 18, the live bearing mammals, or the group above 20 primates, they share anatomical features, which is un not predicted by the creation model. The creation model holds that primates aren't real. It's not a real group. They're not related. They never shared an ancestor. So there should be no traits which the primates share. There should be no traits that the mammals share because mammals aren't a group in the creation model. In the intelligent design model, you shouldn't be able to come up with nervous system traits which appear at spot 16 and a few more at spot 17 and a few more at spot 18 because complexity is irreducible. You can't evolve it in stages. But with each of the systems, that can be done where you can say, all right, well, let's look at the cardiovascular and uh, lymphatic systems. What um, uh, new uh, features uh, evolve uh, or uh, appear in uh, the ancestor of the deuterostomes, of the chordates, of the craniates, of the vertebrates, of the, the bony fish, uh, etc. And so uh, the intelligent design model, uh, once again, predicts whether it be for the cardiovascular system or the digestive system, that you would never see a distribution of traits so that um, a few are added uh, at spot 15 that all members 
uh, after that point in the family tree share. A few more at spot 17, a few more at 20, because complexity is irreducible. You can't have some, but not all of the features of more complex uh, organisms. Now, um, I, I, I kind of apologize because I prefer to teach with videos as opposed to that, but I was trying to give a super fast um, uh, overview. Um, and so uh, I'd now like to kind of step back and kind of try to stress the same points just a little more uh, slowly. So first off, let's look at the skeletal system. There are three models. There is the creation model, the design model, and the evolution model. In the creation model, um, you know, the skeletal systems of the organisms alive today, if they're not in the same kind, they're unrelated. In the design model, you can't get complexity in stages. In the evolution model, there are not only similarities, but a pattern of similarities, and that complexity can develop in stages. So when we look at skulls, all right, um, we see that the skull developed in stages, that the first part was the gill arch skeleton made of cartilage around um, uh, uh, the gills. Then there was a condocranium made of cartilage. Then there was a dermatocranium made of bone. So the skull literally comes in pieces, all right? And some organisms like jawless fish have some pieces but not others, all right? And then if you were to take any of the um, uh, the bones, like the, the frontal bone that I have, the parietal bone that I have. Um, not other animals have that. Other animals, which in the creation model, supposedly I'm 100% unrelated to, they have the same bones that I do, all right? And not only do they have the same bones, all right, but you could then ask, all right, well, is there a pattern? Um, if you look at the bones and the features of these bones, did the complex aspects of, say, my frontal and parietal bones, did it occur in stages? Did my frontal and, and parietal bone just kind of like appear in a complex state? Or uh, did it, um, was there a gradual uh, unfolding of the complexity of the, uh, the traits that I have? And if you were to then study that, I ask, all right, at, um, uh, different points of um, uh, this. At what point do uh, we get these bones? Now, once again, we can argue over some, so I'll put a question mark. You know, so these little pieces of bone, are these the homologs of the frontal in the very first uh, bony fish, or do they only appear in the very first sarcopterygian fish? You know, we can, you know, argue, you know, how, how does this little you know, uh, a piece get uh, interpreted. So once again, in science, you, we don't have to a degree, you're always free to doubt into question. But look at my frontal bone has all of these pieces, a post-orbital bar, a sinus, an orbital process. It's larger, there's a slope to it, a composite part of the orbit. But this developed in stages, some at the amniote level, some in the ancestors of mammals, some in placental mammals, um, et cetera. And I could do that with any of the bones. Not only do other organisms have the same bones that I do, um, but there is a pattern that the complexity of the human bone um, developed in stages at different points in that family tree, which is reflected in which organisms alive today have these various features. Complexity can develop in stages. Big complex bones can actually evolve from little tiny pieces of cartilage, which become bone, and then all fuse together. So if you were to you know, talk about a complex bone, like the human occipital bone or temporal bone, um, et cetera, it would then arise from the fusion of multiple um, uh, pieces. Now, I'm going to, to obviously um, move on, um, but then uh, I have you know, a playlist, if this was something that would be interesting um, to you, that goes through the skull in uh, great uh, detail. And once again, the overwhelming evidence is that um, not only are there shared features, which the evolutionary model predicts, because it, uh, that model predicts that we are related um, to, uh, to other organisms, um, but a pattern so that the vertebrates share more features uh, than uh, the chordates uh, did. The 
um, jawed vertebrates share even more. The, um, uh, the amniotes share even more, the mammals share any more. And then if you were to then look at um, uh, other parts of uh, the skeleton, whether this be uh, the vertebral column or others, we see that one, there are similarities. Two, there is a pattern of similarities where tetrapods have more in common with their vertebral column than um, uh, with each other than with which any had with say a uh, uh, bony fish uh, or you know certainly the jawless uh, fish. Um, if you were to look then at amniotes, there are even more traits which are shared. If you were to look at mammals, there are even more traits that are shared. So not only is there um, not only are there similarities that the evolutionary model predicts, there is a pattern of similarities that is just overwhelmingly supported. And this is not only great um, and, uh, support for evolution, but this is the exact opposite of what uh, creation and intelligent design predicts. So not only does it greatly support the evolutionary model, but greatly undermine that of uh, intelligent uh, design and um, and uh, and the creation uh, model, uh, the uh, mammalian vertebral column um, even uh, more. And then the same uh, would be true of the uh, bones of uh, the arms and legs. And I have a playlist on those. All right, so that then is the skeletal system. So once again, if you study the skeletal system, and I encourage you to, once again, I teach a comparative anatomy course, you know, it's great to study the, um, uh, the skeletal system of, uh, uh, of uh, diverse uh, animals. Um, what you see are one, similarities that the evolutionary model predicts and that the creation doesn't because the creation model holds that I am unrelated to everything else you know, on uh, earth. And if I'm 100% unrelated, then I don't expect similarities. I certainly don't expect a pattern of similarities for there to be things shared among mammals um, that aren't shared uh, with um, uh, reptiles or things that I share with reptiles that aren't shared with amphibians, etc. And if uh, we study um, uh, these uh, structures, we see, oh, look, these amphibians, they have some of my complexity, but not all of it. Oh, and reptiles, they have a little bit more, and mammals have a little bit more. That's true of the skeletal system. It's true of the muscular system. Um, when sharks are moving their eye, uh, uh, when they're moving their eyes, um, they're using essentially the same nerves and the same muscles that I do. I move my eyes with a medial rectus and inferior rectus and inferior oblique, um, et cetera. And then the, um, uh, 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 sharks are doing uh, the same. If I ask, you know, what muscles am I uh, uh, using to walk upright, which is, you know, something that makes, uh, you know, me different, say, than a cat. I have essentially the same leg muscles as uh, a cat does. So there are similarities, but then also a pattern of uh, similarities where uh, uh, the uh, placental mammals would share more uh, in common um, with each other than uh, they would with, say, birds, you know, et cetera. Um, and as you go through the groups, uh, amphibians have some of the muscles that I do. Um, reptiles have a few more. Uh, the egg-laying mammals, uh, the monotremes have a few more, the live-bearing mammals a few more. Um, this muscular complexity is developed in stages. And many of the muscles are actually modified uh, muscles from an ancestral state. So I, in my face and neck, I have a number of muscles uh, whose original function was to move the gills, right? But one can then uh, refer to uh, the, um, uh, the uh, gill arch uh, muscles and their origin and their appearance in different uh, groups. So a comparative uh, anatomy study of a muscular system um, overwhelmingly supports the evolutionary uh, model. Um, 
And then if we were to go through um, uh, the other systems, which once again, the purpose of this video is to kind of provide an overview of how to approach the study and not to be a course of comparative vertebrate anatomy, um, which once again, because I teach the class, I absolutely love and I hope that you as a student, you know, can take a course in comparative ver vertebrate um, uh, anatomy. Um, but let me just kind of uh, uh, then summarize. So it doesn't matter what system of the body you look at. In every single system, you are struck first with similarities between say human anatomy and those of other uh, organisms. Now, because the creation model holds that these other organisms are 100% unrelated to you, there's no expectation that there be any similarities. The evolutionary model holds that there must be, and there are. So the fact that there are similarities then supports the evolutionary model. The fact that there is a pattern of similarity. So lancelets have um, as some of the features of uh, the human uh, spinal cord. Um, uh, then jawless fish have a little bit more. Um, uh, amphibians have a little bit more. Now, in the creation model, not only are these organisms unrelated to us, they are equally unrelated to us. But that's not what the evidence holds. There are more features that unite the vertebrates than we see in the chordates. There are more features that uh, unite the jawed vertebrates than the jawless ones. There are more features that unite the tetrapods, etc. Um, and that not only are there then this pattern of similarities, but along this pattern, then you see complexity developing in stages where say the complexity of the spinal cord at each stage, um, there's more complexity uh, than we had at earlier steps. When you consider the brain, the human brain shares all of its regions. There's no region of the human brain which is unique to humans. But not only are there similarities with other organisms, but a pattern of similarities. You know, vertebrates share some features of, um, uh, of, uh, of the brain. Um, the jawed vertebrates share more. The um, amphibians share more and so forth. And we see the same whether we're looking at the cardiovascular system, the digestive system, the urinary uh, and reproductive uh, systems. And once again, I have videos and I'll hope to continue adding more for my students in comparative vertebrate anatomy. So one can ask the question, uh, how did life's forms arrive at its, its uh, current uh, you know, state? Um, if you doubt what your teacher says or what, what your textbook says or what this website says, well, good for you. Scientists doubt. That's your job. All right. And so if you say, is there enough evidence for this? Is there another idea? That's good. You're thinking scientifically if you do that. Good for you. Okay. But if you come up with another model, like the creation model or the intelligent design model. It is not scientific to say, I have another idea. Let's teach that in classes alongside the best proven theory in all of science. No, the question is, what evidence then supports your model? Publish it, do experiments and, and say, I hold that uh, all living groups are unrelated to each other. They don't share a common ancestry. And I'm now going to study anatomy and show that these organisms are 100% unrelated and equally unrelated. No one has done that yet. Um, if you're going to say, I feel that complexity is irreducible, that you can't have you know, organisms with some but not all of the features of more complex structures, fine, go out and study that. But whether it be the eye or the brain or the skeletal system, um, we find the structures that humans have in organisms which have some, but not all of those features. Complexity is not irreducible, it just isn't. Because when we look at these other organisms, you see some, but not all of the features that you would see uh, in uh, humans, as any study of comparative anatomy uh, would uh, illustrate. And so, while it is wonderful to come up with alternate uh, ideas, uh, uh, one that must test them, and the evolutionary model. 
the model which holds that the anatomy that you see in modern organisms evolved over time, that the explanation uh, for the similarities and the pattern of similarities is the shared ancestry. Um, this model has overwhelming anatomical uh, support um, and opposing models are overwhelmingly refuted by anatomical studies. Anyone who says differently either isn't familiar with the evidence or is misrepresenting uh, this uh, evidence. So the uh, study of anatomy overwhelmingly supports the prediction of the evolutionary model.